and talk to her about the books if you need to get one there too. Um, and then you might check and see if you're on the cleaning schedule. Seems to be rather empty and some of you might have missed putting your names down on the cleaning schedule. So uh, uh, we, we probably need to fill that in. And uh, other than that, I think that's all the sort of daily announcements to read your bulletins and, and keep up with everything there. Let's uh, turn to 375 here in our blue psalters, and we'll sing this before we begin our worship. Welcome everyone, you have come to worship God together here at Christ the King PCA. I love things that are enduring, if you'll notice that hymn comes from the 11th century, that's a thousand years ago. Someone penned those words already, and uh, to extol the name of Jesus, that sweet name which encourages us all, which in he along with the Father and the and the Holy Spirit invite us into his presence this morning to bow down before him and to be nourished and encouraged and strengthened in his grace. So let's do that by beginning to pray together and let's quietly ask God's blessing. Indeed, you, O oh our God, are our shepherd, our king, our redeemer, the one who invites us into your presence, who sends your Holy Spirit, who causes us to be your children in this world, who gives us the hope of everlasting life and the resurrection of the dead. For all these things, we give you thanks as we come humbly into your presence this morning as we bow and as we lift up our voices and our hearts in worship to you. So be pleased, Lord, with the thoughts and the meditations of our hearts, for we bring them in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together and respond from the scriptures to God's invitation to worship him? Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation, when his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. 
And God says to you, his people this morning, grace and mercy and peace be upon you and abide in you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our praises to God by turning to 83 there in our blue Psalter hymnals, number 83. And we'll sing all the stanzas of this. Five verses on the beginning. Five verses. Yeah, what? One through four and seven. They won't let me sing all seven of them this morning, I guess. All right, one through four and seven. As we come into God's presence, it's always a time for reflection, for praise, for thanksgiving, but also to look at our own hearts and to examine our lives. Uh, the, the apostle expressed his life as one of pushing onward, pushing toward the prize. And the, one of the ways that we do that is to examine ourselves and say, am I walking in God's ways? Am I walking in the way that he wants me to, to reflect his glory and his person uh, and to look like the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and when we read the commandments, that's what we're doing because Jesus is the one who performed all of those perfectly on our behalf and now asks us to walk in the same way as he did. Uh, this is from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days 
You shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And Jesus then summarized all of these statements in the New Testament when he said, what is, what is the essence of all these? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Let's take these into a time of prayer and confession, and repentance, and I'll close for us then after we've had time to pray. Merciful God, the one whose mercies reach to the heaven, the one who is grace, has grace which is greater than all of our sins. We come into your presence this morning with humility, with repentance, seeking your will and your ways in our lives, in our innermost thoughts, in the way we speak, in the things that we do, even in our aspirations and our goals, all these, Lord, we lay at your feet. For we know that unless we walk in tune with you, your blessing remains far from us and your discipline rides hard upon us. And so we ask as your people, Lord, that you would sanctify us in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would help us to war against sin and the flesh and the devil, wherever it may appear, whether it's external to us or internal in our minds, in our hearts. We confess, Lord, that we are weak, but you are strong, that we have no power apart from you, that we need the, the convicting power and the reassuring power, the resurrection power, which comes to us from you. And so, Lord, as your people, we determine to turn away from sin and to seek righteousness all the days of our life. We determine to listen to your words and hide them in our hearts that we might not sin against you. All of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing a hymn of confession as well as part of our prayers this morning, number 406 in our Blue Psalter hymnals, number 406.
I remind you of this great promise of God in Ephesians chapter 2 and in the verses 8 and 9 where God tells us how we find our salvation with these words here. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The beauty of salvation is that God is the initiator and God is the one who gives us the grace and gives us a new heart. And then we live out of the power of that new salvation. So receive these words as your assurance that when you're trusting by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have been saved according to the word of God. Let's turn our hearts to prayer this morning. Uh, please continue to remember Brother Jim, who's got a bad kidney stone, he's, uh, I don't know if all of you heard, but he was supposed to have that dealt with last Monday, and then COVID-19 stepped in again, and he didn't have a test, so he couldn't get it. He couldn't get the surgery done. So he's scheduled for next Wednesday again. Um, so let's remember him in, his, in our prayers, as well as there's uh, many other things that are listed there in your bulletin. Please take that sheet home with you too and remember throughout the week to pray let's gather to our God though do you lift up your hearts to God today O oh our God is your day a day that you have set aside for your people to rest in your grace to remember that uh, your work is enough to save us to remember that your work is enough to keep us to guide us to lead us in all the paths of righteousness for your own name's sake and indeed when we look at our lives lord we see that you have led us by the green pastures and the still waters though we may have had problems yet we are here today rejoicing in you yet we are here today being being spoken to by the living God sitting his, in his presence being nourished on his word there is no greater privilege than to know and to walk with you the living God to look around your world and see that you have made all things and that you have not just wound them up and let them go but you as as the master planner are performing your works in this world even today how grateful we are to know lord that your hand controls all things even the very days of our lives we think of our brother jim who's who's uh in pain and suffering right now you knew of that lord ahead of time you will walk with him through it and you will deliver him in your good timing from it and in all things you do that for us, Lord. You never leave us nor forsake us, but you go with us in the highs and in the lows, in the valleys and over the mountains of life. And we're grateful for that, Lord. We're grateful that, that your church continues to grow in this world. That just as you have promised, Lord, that there will be come one day people from every language and tongue and nation to bow down before your throne that even now in our world today praises are lifted to you this morning in in German and Swahili and Chinese and in every other imaginable language Lord we pray for the progress of the gospel within our presbytery within our churches within the new church plants within uh, the, the, the wide scope of our uh, denomination, but beyond that, Lord, within your people everywhere, all of those who call truly upon your name will be blessed this morning. All of those who lift up their voice in the truth 
will hear the voice of Jesus speaking throughout the world today. And Lord, we, we are so thankful that we are among those who have responded to the call of the gospel. That we are among those, some of us for many generations now, who have been walking in covenant with you. And so that we look forward to the day, Lord, when when all of your elect children will be gathered in, that all of us will sit around the throne giving you praises directly there in heaven, when all of us will obey you for all of eternity and sin and destruction and wickedness will be wiped out forevermore. In the meantime, we must live in this world, Lord, full of turmoil. We think of our own nation in a, a cycle of election now and the civil strife that has taken place uh, even the death of a one of the supreme court justices this week uh, to add a fire to the flames it seems and we're asking lord that you as you have said will rule over the kingdoms of man and that you will rule over us through this election as well we know lord that it is uh, incumbent upon us to pray for those who are in authority over us, even in times when we don't always agree with uh, what they're doing or the laws they're enacting. We still pray that you would continue to deliver us, continue to let us have a place of peace where we can work quietly, where we can share with our neighbors, where we can uh, look for and help in the progress of the church around the world. We pray for our missionaries this morning, whether they be in, in Lebanon or, or Africa, Armenia, scattered around the world in many different places, Lord. Encourage their hearts. May they sense your call upon them like uh, Isaiah says about the beauty of the feet of the people who carry the gospel around the world. May they have a, a sense of purpose in their lives, though they may be far away from us. And now, Lord, we, we pray also that uh, you would gather in those who are wandering away from you. We think especially of members of our own family who may not be loving you as they should or perhaps have cast you behind their back at this moment in time. We remember, Lord, your promise to us that you would be a God to us and to our children, that when we walk in faithful covenant with us, that you will indeed keep your promises to us. And so, Lord, we pray for them, for their repentance and restoration uh, to your church. And Lord, uh, now bless us as we uh, look forward to hearing from your word this morning. May it be powerful in our minds and our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn and sing once more before we uh, come to the word this morning. Uh, number 82 in our white folders. Number 82 in our white folders. We'll stand and sing this together.
may be seated. Well, let's take our Bibles, beloved, and turn to the Gospel of Matthew. For those of you who are visiting with us this morning, we're currently in a series through the Gospel of Matthew where we began at the very first book, um, first verse of the book, and we're up to chapter 12 this morning. So I invite everyone to find a copy of, of the scriptures on their phones or in the pews or over there in the back. Uh, bookcase if you'd like one as well. We're looking today at Matthew chapter 12 beginning at verse 19, beginning at verse 19, actually beginning back at verse 15, 15. Let's hear the word of the Lord here. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there and many followed him and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fill, fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry out aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we draw near to your word, we do it with the thought in our minds that this is the living and powerful sword sharper than any two-edged sword which you use to dissect our souls with, which you use to proclaim truth and judgment and righteousness in this world. And we wish to hear it with all of our heart, Lord. We wish to be drawn near to you by it. We wish to have its power unleashed in our lives. So grant us that, Lord, as we look at together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the immediate context now, uh, of course, the broader context, Matthew writes all about Jesus is the king, and the kingdom of God has come upon us. It's not something we're waiting for out in the future, contrary to much uh, prophetical teaching nowadays. We believe that, that what Jesus said literally was true, that the kingdom of God is here that the kingdom of God has come upon you and that it's evidenced by repentance and faith in this Messiah King. And Matthew's been marching us through that whole idea of how do we know it is the King? How do we see it is the King through his power, through his wisdom, through his teaching, uh, uh, through all the different manifestations that, that he had? Last week, uh, he was manifesting himself as king by saying I, I am I am God himself the one who set the days in motion and now I can come down into your midst and, and I'm Lord of even the Sabbath day I'm Lord of the days of the week I change them I rearrange them I, I work through them because I'm the king well that of course uh infuriated his enemies because they looked at him and they thought of him as merely a man there standing before him. And so when he said statements like he said last week, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, I'm, I'm God of everything, then they made plans to kill him. So that's where we find ourselves in, in this particular passage here then it says in verse 15 and Jesus aware of this aware of the fact that they were planning to kill him withdrew from there and many followed him and he healed them all and he ordered them not to make him known this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah then he quotes this long section out of the prophet Isaiah 
One of the things that infuriated the people of Jesus' day and is still a stumbling block to the people of our day is that Jesus doesn't meet their expectations. They want, and we want today sometimes, a, a, a powerful-looking figure. Look at our own president. What's he do? He, he goes out on the stump. Every week now, every day, he's been in, on the TV. He's uh, tweeting. He's, he's gathering people for these giant rallies over there. Whether you agree with that or not, whether you think that's safe or not, that's irrelevant. The fact is, he's projecting his power, isn't he? He wants that office, and he wants to have it again, and he wants to project that power. But when Jesus comes, he's wholly different. Even though he proclaims himself as the king of the Jews, his appearance is entirely different from the kings of his day. I mean, the kings of his day were the same as the, the great rulers of our day. They, they liked to project power. They, they came with a troop of soldiers. They had their baggage trains. They, 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 uh, uh, they made a splash. They wanted everyone to notice him. But Jesus goes about quietly doing good. And that's this, uh, you might say, Matthew is, is explaining to us, he's your king, but he's not going to be the king that you thought he was going to be. He's going he's gonna to have an appearance. He's going to have a working that's entirely different. And it's just in accordance with exactly how the prophet Isaiah prophesied he would be. Behold my servant, verse 18, whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. What is a servant? Well, a servant is an unassuming person, aren't they? Servants in those days were people of no account. I mean, they were like invisible pieces of furniture in the house. Maybe the masters wouldn't even know their names sometimes. And here comes, here he comes, the mighty one of God, the second person of the Trinity, God himself taking human flesh upon him, and he, he doesn't make a splash. He comes and quietly works among them. Healing, uh, I, I, I like verse 15, and many followed him, and he healed them all. He's just like, it's another day. I'm going to go about God's work. And I'm going to heal people. I'll make the blind see, the lame walk. I'll, I'll even cast the demons out of people that have possessed their lives and ruined their, their humanity. And while I do that, I will not even let them acknowledge who I am. It's uh, in many places in the Gospels where the the demons themselves wanted to cry out that he was the son of God and he forbids them from doing that. The total opposite of what we think of as a great leader nowadays. And yet there's something also in that term of, of a servant that is marvelous because he's not just anybody's servant. He is the servant of of the living God. And though he may not meet the expectations of the world, God has exalted him in that office of bringing about salvation, of, of bringing his kingdom into the world. He is the chosen one from God. And that word itself ought to make us pause, not to go in necessarily in the direction of the doctrine of predestination, but, but to think about this, 
there is a plan of God and a chosen way of God of doing things in this world. And he's not going to bind himself to men's expectations. Now, that doesn't mean he's not coming with, without power, though, beloved. And I think that this is central to this passage of Scripture. As though he may look unassuming, and though he may be unassuming in his demeanor, even, even in his presentation to the world, he is not a powerless individual. And we know that from the scriptures here because it says in, in the middle of verse 18 these words, very important words for the text. I will put my spirit upon him. You see, what makes the difference in this world between success and failure? What makes the difference in this world between powerlessness and powerfulness is the Spirit of God's coming upon Jesus. Uh, just a, a couple of verses in, in that same vein. Luke chapter 4, remember before he goes into the wilderness, it says, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. In uh, that same chapter in verse 18 of Luke, uh, of chapter 4 of Luke, it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. John chapter 3 and verse 34 is, repeats this same thought again. For whom he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now we know that Jesus was the Holy Son of God, the, the second person of the Trinity, God himself. But as he took human flesh upon himself, he relies in that mystical union of God and man upon the Holy Spirit to empower his work and his words and his, his life on this earth. And beloved, that's where real power comes from in this world. It's not in the flashiness of the person. It's not in their popularity or their eloquence or their uh, uh, ability to strong arm other people. It's in the quiet work of the Holy Spirit in and through their lives. That's why the Apostle Paul uh, says these words later on in one of his epistles, Ephesians chapter 5, he says, Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. You see, Jesus wants to empower us in this, in this world in the same way in which he was empowered when he walked upon this by giving place to the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's why the apostle in, in one of his other epistles warns us of this in, in 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of Jesus Christ for you. Do not quench the Spirit. You see, it's not in our own efforts and presentation of, the, of ourselves in this world that will accomplish the great works of God in this world. It's going to be when we give, when we stop quenching the Spirit, when we stop exerting our own selfishness and self-will, when we stop hanging on to our sins and quenching the Spirit and instead allow Him place in our lives, allow Him to fill up all the nooks and the crannies and the parts of our hearts and our souls so that we will walk with Him and walk in the ways of God. 
But that's a very hopeful thing, isn't it, beloved? Because even if we wanted pro to project power in this world, most of us can't do much. We're, we're not the famous, we're not the strong, and, and, and we're, we're not the able. We're very oftentimes the opposite of that. We're the weak, we're the insignificant, and we're the unaccounted for in this world. But do not despair about that, beloved, because if you are a child of the living God, and as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he has sent his spirit into our hearts that we might be, be the sons of God, then you too have an opportunity to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Now that's something more than just, than just being given the Spirit. I mean, every believer is given the Spirit. The, the, the Scriptures teach us that everyone whose heart has been born again, who knows Jesus, has a place of the, uh, has been placed within him the Holy Spirit of God. But the Apostle then stretches, stresses a, a different fact, and that is be filled with the Spirit. You have the Spirit, beloved, according to the Scriptures. But not everybody is filled. Some people are busy quenching the power of God in their life instead of allowing the power of God to flow freely within them. And this ought to be a prayer that we, we pray many times and over and over in our lives. God Fill me with the Spirit because then I will accomplish the things that you want in this world. Then I will become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will act like him. And even then it may not be great actions. Look at the, the actions of Jesus, the manner in which he accomplishes uh, uh, salvation itself and 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 the assertion of his kingship in this world, it's not by quarreling out loud. No one even heard his voice in the streets. Now we need to understand in the context here what that means. Obviously they heard the voice of Jesus. He spoke to many people, didn't he? And he even taught and he preached. But he was, was not this combative type of individual. He wasn't the, the next rebel of the Judean countryside. He was not trying to be the next political leader of that society. He was content to quietly go about his work, to quietly speak for God and from God, and that was the essence of the way that he went about his business. It's a great model for us, isn't it? One we can all follow in too. Quietly going about our work and our lives, speaking for God, not weakly, not out of weakness, but out of gentleness and meekness with the power of the Spirit being that which is forward in our lives. The power of the Spirit, which is going to break down the barriers before us. The power of the Spirit, which is going to work in other people's lives as well. And along with this sort of meek attitude, this unassuming servant-like life of Jesus was, was a life of great mercy as well. The, uh, Matthew teaches us as he quotes Isaiah these words he says a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench I mean he's he, he's not stomping all over everyone and think, think of the, the, the sort of the word picture here a bruised reed he will not break <laughs> Reeds are rather worthless things. Who cares if you step on them? 
and break them. They're not good for anything. You know, you can't gather them up and burn them. You can't eat them. They're, they're just sort of strawy sticks out there. But Jesus is so compassionate and caring about the humanity around him that he says I, he wouldn't even break off a bruised reed or he won't even snuff out a smoldering wick. Well, what's he mean by that? That means that, that he's going to reach out to the lost and the dying, no matter how worthless they seem. I mean, these are two examples of very worthless things. You ever put a candle out or, or blown it out, and, and, and what, it, what does it do? It just sits there and smolders, smokes up your house, and it's not lighting anything up anymore. It's not functioning as at, at it, it should. And, and what do you usually do? You, well, if you're like me, you lick your fingers and you s snuff it out, right? Get rid of it. And that's the, the word picture. The kindness and the greatness of Jesus, his strength in the Holy Spirit enables him to come alongside of, of worthless things. And all of humanity fits that category, actually. And bring the good news to them. That's a great kind of power to have and to exert in this world. You know, it is, it's the quiet power, but the most pronounced power, you might say. Think of the world around us to, to, to give us an example of this. You know, everybody is, is afraid of earthquakes and, and, and floods and and, and uh, forest fires like we've had in California, these, these seem to be such powerful things. Yet, what's more powerful than all of those? Gravity, which you don't think about, you don't pay any attention to, and yet essentially holds the entire world together, right? Right? Or, 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 or think of the sun versus lightning. Lightning is a terrifying thing. And, and it can strike things and break trees and strike our houses and even kill people. But wouldn't you rather be the sun than a bolt of lightning? Because the sun nourishes. The sun grows the whole world. The sun warms the whole world. This is Jesus, you see, though he may seem very unassuming and the, the Spirit's work may be a quiet, unassuming work in the world, yet there is such a mightiness of this underlying strength there. And that's what God wants for us, beloved, because he tells us to be filled with the Spirit. And in fact, Jesus unassuming servanthood was so powerful that it accomplishes the unthinkable. In the, at the end of verse uh, 20 and 21, he says, until he brings justice to victory, <coughs> excuse me, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. This Holy Spirit power in the heart of the king who has come into this world will not be denied, cannot be stopped. And it's, it's illustrated by those two things there in the last part of the text. He brings justice to victory. Unassuming though our Savior may be rejected by men, as Isaiah says, with no form that we should desire him, Yet, in the end, he is everything. Because he goes to the cross and he brings about righteousness in the hearts of men and that righteousness ultimately becomes the victory for mankind. 
Because without righteousness, without holiness, no one will see God. No one will survive this life and live into eternal life. But he does that for you, beloved. And not only uh, people of Jesus, they might have looked at him and seen him as insignificant, even with his, his own society. But what does the scriptures teach us here? His victory will be so great that it will be the hope of all the ends of the earth. Isaiah calls them the coastlands. That means the people far away. And isn't that true, beloved? Look at you sitting here in Hastings, thousands of miles away from the Holy Land, thousands of years after that appearing of Jesus, and yet you are here today having the righteousness of Christ in your heart and in your life. You are here today knowing that same Jesus, unassuming though he may have seemed at the time, he's revolutionized your life. And he's changed society after society and land after land. This is a Savior you can get on board to follow, see? The one we need. The one that the world may overlook, but not us, his children. And this is the Savior who you ought to follow in the same way. Being unassuming, but full of the Holy Spirit's power as you give place to him in your life. And then I am confident we will see the, see the same victories that were promised to our king. That the coastlands will come to him. That the nations will be brought in to worship him and to know his righteousness. Shall we pray? Oftentimes we look at ourselves and say, who are we, Lord? Who are we to do anything for you? And in some regards, that is the right attitude, but it's also wrong because that's looking at us, looking at ourselves. And we want to look to you, the living God. We want to make place to be, not just to have the Spirit within us, but to be filled with him in the entirety of our lives. So that you might be glorified in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us uh, prepare to come to the Lord's table. If you're visiting, please read that uh, little section at the bottom there about how we do our communion service. If you're a member in good standing in an evangelical or reformed church, you may come to the Lord's table with us if you heart is prepared to do that. Uh, if you're not, then just please refrain and, and uh, use this time for prayer. We want to come to the Lord's table, but before we do, let's uh, stand and sing together number 25 in our white folders.
Amen. You may be seated. You know, in that text that we were thinking through together today here, it says, until he brings justice to victory. One of the quandaries of life in this world is, how can we be saved if it's a holy God we must answer to? How can we be saved if, if it's perfection that we need and that's not what we have? We have the very opposite of perfection in our lives. How can a just God welcome us into his presence knowing all the things that are in our thoughts and minds and deeds in this world which are not pleasing to him? How can he be just and do that? Well, he's, he does it because he serves his justice through by punishing his son for us. See, that's how he brings justice to victory, doesn't he, beloved? See, he remains completely holy, honorable, and just because he doesn't overlook your sins. He punishes them in Jesus. And Jesus carries them away from you and gives you instead his righteousness, the righteousness that will stand before the holy and just God. And we celebrate that when we come to the Lord's table. We remember he brings justice to victory through the death of his son on the cross. So let's gather again and remember what Jesus has done. Father in heaven, we come to your table, the table of the Lord Jesus Christ here this morning and it is the embodiment in pictures Lord of what you just told us in the scriptures that justice has been served and is victorious at the same time because your son was willing to bear all of our sins away so we come to remember that to rejoice in that to be refreshed and encouraged and strengthened in that in Jesus name we pray Jesus doesn't want us to forget his death ever to the very end of the world. And so in addition to the preaching of the word of God, he has, he has given us a sacrament to remember that all the time, that we might taste and see and keep acknowledging that, that God's justice has been served, mercy has found us, and we now are able to come and stand before the living God. And does it by giving us this memorial meal. What he said to his disciples as he took bread and he gave thanks for it that evening. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This bread which we break is a communion with the body of Christ broken for us. In the same way after supper he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim my death until I come again. Justice has its victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. So come, beloved, take of the elements, the bread and the wine, and then just uh, return to your seats and we'll partake together.
Take the bread, beloved, eat, remember, and believe that the body of Christ was broken for you to take away all of your sins. And now take the cup, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of Jesus was poured out to wash, wash away all of your sin. Let's close our time at the Lord's table by praying that prayer together he taught his disciples. Our Father, Let's now stand and sing our final song to the Lord, number 317, verse 4. Number 317 in our blue psalters, stanza 4. God, you send you forth with his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. The grace of Jesus be and abide upon you now and forevermore. Amen.